Welcome back to Rasmussar TV. Today, I'm really happy to have um, Shannon Winslow. And Shannon, I have known her for a couple of years. We met in an event in the United States, a martial arts event. And let me just welcome Shannon. Hi, Shannon. How are you? I'm well. Uh, it's really an honor to be here on Rasmussar TV. Thank you very much, uh, Shannon. Could you please, and Shannon does uh, or has done, uh, has been doing actually a couple of martial arts. And I'm going to ask uh, Shannon about her martial arts journey. She's also an instructor and she's going to talk about her experience in martial arts. Let me just start like that. First, before we go to martial arts, Shannon, tell our viewers who you are first. You know, that's the interesting thing because Shannon is also an artist. Right? <laughs> Yeah, I, I'm a sculptor, um, and I uh, have been working on a bunch of monumental uh, life-size bronze um, sculptures. Um, and we—it's—it's—I've been learning a lot this year about how to do that. Um, I'm working under another artist, and it's—it's it's been a really great experience. And what kind of sculptures do you make? Could you just give us some uh, information about that? It's just like human sculptures or animal or what time well we're doing a lot of uh human figures um but we have some uh, animal sculptures on our docket as well coming up oh, this year so beautiful, beautiful. Uh, could you please tell us when you started with martial arts or practicing martial arts um i started back when i was in college when i was uh when i was about 20 years old, I uh, encountered some, I went to a Renaissance fair and I wanted to learn about swords and sword fighting and everything. And I met my good friend, uh, Jesse Kula at the Renaissance fair. And he told me, hey, not only do people know how to make these swords and these weapons and everything, because he was working at a, a, at a booth that sold the swords. He's like, but we also have a group that actually studies how to do a lot of this historical European martial arts or uh, Western martial arts. Um, and Jesse is a, is a uh, provost in good standing with the Chicago Swordplay Guild now. Um, and so that was my introduction to martial arts was actually, um, you know, doing a lot of uh, Italian longsword. Okay. Oh, Italian longsword. And w mm -hmm. why did you want to learn how to fight with a sword? Why did you um, want to learn that? I <laughs> guess I always really loved that, that kind of history. I loved learning about uh, medieval knights. Um, ever since I was, I don't know, like a kid, I, I loved reading fantasy. I loved reading a lot of history. Um, and so that really appealed to me. I always... I always thought it'd be fun to do. I mean, when I was in high school, I don't know that I'd call it like learning a martial art, but like my friends and I used to make our own wooden swords and we'd go out in the backyard and hit each other with them. You know, <laughs> it, it was not, it was not an actual martial art. It was just a bunch of kids like hurting each other. <laughs> That's right. I, <laughs> lovely. And uh, okay, so long sword. Uh, did you start uh, to learn? Okay, because there are different uh, types. As far as I know, please help me if I make a mistake. There is a tradition of German long sword and Italian long sword. Am I correct? And you, yeah. you started Italian way. Why not German way? Um, for one, it was the availability. Um, I met Jesse Kula and he was part of the Chicago Swordplay Guild. Um, and so the CSG focuses on the Italian art. Um, and that was mostly why, um, kind, of, kind of a happy accident. And I'm really thankful that I started with the Italian school because um, a lot of, I, I'm very familiar with that kind of mindset because of the Renaissance and um, Renaissance and medieval history, and then how it ties into art, you know, it, 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 it was already kind of a, a familiar um, kind of environment in a way. Um, whereas, and that's not to put down the German stuff, but right now I'm attending a school that studies a lot and focuses more on the German school. And to me, there are some ways that they think about things and express things that's just very, very different 
Um, and so I kind of appreciate the Italian kind of humanist background that I have with the Chicago Swordplay Guild. But I also really love the German stuff as well with Chivalry Today out here in San Diego. Okay, now you're talking to a guy who has been living in Germany for a long time, right? And is, as a German citizen, I would like to ask you what makes this, you know, German, especially German to you. I would really love to hear your opinion. Tell us. Exact difference between German sort or just that is like German mentality or tradition you feel. What, what did you feel the difference? So, you know, it's something that I've been thinking about a lot and I have the hardest time putting my finger on it. Like there, there are, um, the idea, I, I guess one of the big differences between the Italian school and the German school is that the German school really talks a lot about and focuses on keeping the bind and on like keeping that kind of, keeping in contact with the other person's sword. Whereas the Italian school is much more comfortable with kind of, you know, percussively striking the opponent's sword away. And that's not to say that the Italians never come into the bind or that the Germans don't use percussive um, strikes to clear their opponent's weapon. It's just like, it's like a different emphasis. Um, and to me, I think too, perhaps part of the difference between the Italian school and the German school is that it, and this is my opinion, right? Um, I'm not an expert, but I'm someone who's, you know, familiar with these things. I think that Fiore um, with the Italian school is really focused, focused much more on combat and a combat environment. Whereas the German school, um, the German school seemed to be more um, concerned with like dueling um, or, or some situation perhaps in which like it's more common for people not to be wearing a lot of armor. Um, and so you get more slices in the German school. You get more wounders, like wounders rather than like necessarily fight enders. Um, but this is, this is just my opinion. And um, there are wonderful things in both uh, traditions that I really love. So, it's wonderful because uh, I was doing a second interview yesterday with Devin, and and he was explaining his Bolognese shield or buckler and sword tradition, and he was explaining exactly the same that he said the German sword and buckler tends to search and keep the bind all the time, whereas the Italian Bolognese tradition is. You know, exactly what you were saying. That's why I found it so interesting. Oh, that's good. That's good. <laughs> and you know, Devin is a very experienced uh, swordsman, right? You know, So exactly what, but he was not explaining the long sword. He was explaining sword and buckler traditions. Well, exactly yeah. what you said. That's very oh, fascinating. <laughs> fascinating, you know. You know and he said, oh, wow, I heard that already, you know, but with another yeah. weapon set. Okay. Yeah, of course. These are also part of the culture mm -hmm. and cult every cultural activity shows the culture behind it. And what mm -hmm. other weapon do you like in Italian tradition or pra you oh, practice? Oh, in the Italian tradition? Um, I, I'll play with just about anything. I, I love grappling um, because I, I also do uh, Brazilian jiu-jitsu, um, but I, I love doing the armored combat. Um, as well and fighting in armor for me is a lot of fun but, but I don't know I like spear I I'm not I'm not that particularly partial um, and I think part of that is because Fiore is very much um, a, presented as a set system where you can you know apply things that you know uh, no matter what the situation and no matter what is in your hands, in a way, it's, you're, you're always doing the same thing, um, which is, which I really appreciate how that's organized. Um, the German tr tradition, you have more like um, specific masters talking about specific um, weapons. Um, and it's not always presented as a cohesive system the way that Fiore is. Um, and that's not to put them down or anything like that. It's just what survived and, and, you know, what we have available to us. 
I think I remember that you also back in the United States told me that you lo loved dagger fighting as well. I remember that, right? <laughs> dagger fighting is fun. <laughs> Could you explain? At least when you're practicing. <laughs> <laughs> in a reverse grip, if I remember it correctly, you liked it, right? Like dagger like that, right? Sure. I mean, that's like a great way to throw an overhand blow. <laughs> That's right. Absolutely. Could you tell us about your armor? What type of armor uh, do you use or do you have? Uh, so my armor is um, kind of, it, it's a uh, early to mid 15th century armor. Um, and it's made out of high carbon tempered steel. So it's very durable. Um, I was out of I didn't realize how important that was until I was at a uh, WMAW, um, what was it, two years ago now? It's so weird dealing with time in COVID. Um, but I was at WMAW and I was participating in a deed and I watched this guy who is very large get thrown in his armor, but his armor was mild steel and it totally crushed some of his plates when he got thrown. And I was like, ah, that's why the high carbon stainless steel was a really good choice for me. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, mild steel is not a good choice. Absolutely. <laughs> no, <laughs> no. But uh, I, I'm not a big fan of the pig, pig snout helms that were very common to that time period. So I have a much more kind of rounded uh, visor that I use. Why don't um, you like those? I Aesthetically, it just offends me <laughs> I guess I'm not I'm not a good Fiore person because I don't like the pig pig snout helm but aesthetically it just never appealed to me it look it makes it makes us look like 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 an insect right is it or like a bird or what is this I I don't know I just think it looks goofy <laughs> <laughs> that's right I may agree with you it's not a beautiful helmet I agree no no, that's right. I mean, I have seen beautiful examples, but that's just not me. <laughs> uh, not. And what do you practice to prepare for a, a armored fighting? What do you do specifically for that? As far um, as fitness is concerned. Oh, as far as fitness is concerned? Yeah. Well, I, I always try to keep myself in shape no matter what's going on. Um, so like, and a lot of that is... Um, BJJ, well, I haven't been doing BJJ because of COVID very much, you know, but um, usually my routine would be doing BJJ like probably four or five times a week. Um, on top of that, doing some yoga and um, if I can, some swimming. I always have to, I, as far as um, upper body strength is concerned, a lot of times I like uh, practicing pull-ups and those kinds of exercises. I do a lot of body weight exercises as opposed to um, a lot of the more traditional weightlifting exercises. Part of that is just, is just that for me, it's my personal preference. I, I find personally for me, and I, I give people who do it a lot of respect, but just for me, picking things up and putting things down is not very fun for me. Um, and so I find that no matter what your fitness goals are, try to find something that appeals to you and is fun for you. Um, and that will help motivate you to stay um, in good shape and continue training. Um, since COVID has been a thing, I've been doing a lot of solo, like heavy bag workouts um, in additionally, and I've been enjoying those a lot. <laughs> you mean like boxing Muay Thai? With heavy yeah, band. boxing Mai Tai workouts. I would not consider myself a boxer or a Muay Thai martial artist, um, but I know enough to throw some punches and some kicks competently. Um, and so like, I just, I'll pop in uh, actually Boss Rutan's old workout CDs and- uh, <laughs> You're trying, oh yeah, of course, he's a great guy. Okay, of course, and, yeah, <laughs> yeah, of course. I, I like his workout. See, no, he's great. Really he's good. great. He's one of the best yeah. instructors. Absolutely. I mean, he's, <laughs> and he's a fun guy, right? He's really fun to hang around with. You know, he seems I mean, just... like quite the character. <laughs> yeah, of course. Okay. No, I mean, 
<laughs> Beautiful, of course. He's a very experienced guy as well. Excellent, excellent. And um, could you tell, tell us a bit now, when did you start with BJJ? And, and why? So you uh, you started to be interested in BJJ after uh, long or, or right? Am mm -hmm. I correct? After you did that? Yes. What sparked your interest? Why did you become interested in BJJ? Uh, well, probably for a lot of people. Um, I liked watching the UFC. Uh, in my opinion, the UFC a bit longer ago was a lot more exciting than it is now. But <laughs> Everyone knows all techniques. Now you, there is nothing you can do, of course, right? You know. Yeah. But, uh, I, you know, the rules have changed a little bit. Um, and I think that has part of it. That's part of it for me. Um, but I really liked watching uh, UFC. And that was the first time I had ever heard of Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Um, and then, you know, I, I found out, oh, it deals with, you know, doing a lot of things on the ground. And with my long sword, I just wasn't, I just didn't feel like I was getting enough experience grappling. And the thing that Fiore doesn't talk about like at all is what to do on the ground. Um, that's not really something that Fiore really talks about very much at all. Uh, from what I understand, the German tradition has a lot more in-depth uh, wrestling techniques, um, but Fiore was only dealing for things in combat or things that were applicable for combat. So um, that kind, and, and on a battlefield, the last place you want to be is on the ground. <laughs> Oh, it's one thing if it's like a one-on-one -on -one kind of situation but when you're dealing with a bunch of people and then there's debris all over the place the last the last thing you want to talk about is what to do on the ground plus I think Fiore for example probably assumed people already knew a lot of that stuff so he didn't really talk about it um but with longsword I didn't know very much about what to do on the ground and I was like hey, maybe I should check this BJJ stuff out since it deals with grappling. I'd get more experience and I'd also find out what to do when I'm on the ground. Um, and so coincidentally, a BJJ school started up in my hometown and I was like, oh, I'll just go there. And so that's where I went and I fell in love with it. Yes. Tell me about your, uh, your um, let's say, do you like gi or no gi in BJJ? Very famous I'm question. weird. I like both. <laughs> you like both? Okay. I like both. I will say, though, I'm, I'm probably not as good in no gi as I am in gi. Um, but uh, I really like no gi because it, it's very explosive. It's very athletic. You know, you've got to... The, the tempo of the fight is a bit different because you don't have those grips to slow things down. But I also really like gi because I really like slowing it down and being super technical and everything as well. So I appreciate both of them quite a bit. Okay, <laughs> interesting you know, that you like both. Normally people prefer this or that, right? That's interesting. I know, most people do, but I, I, I appreciate both of them. I appreciate both of them quite a bit. Okay. Which, uh, I mean, I know, I mean, because many martial artists watch this channel, mostly they're you know, from uh, strikers or UFC or MMA or uh, grapplers. Tell us uh, which type of grappling techniques do you prefer? Do you, okay, let me just help you this way. Would you like to be on your back or would you like to control the fight from the top position? I much prefer being on top. Um, and... You know, I used to do a lot of things on the ground, on my back and everything, but uh, I went to a, a jiu-jitsu school at one point in which there were a bunch of guys who were all in the fire department who were in my class, and they were all really big and really strong, and it was just a lot easier to deal with if I was on top of them <laughs> instead of them on top of me. <laughs> Plus, I, I prefer to practice that way because I feel that, you know, my BJJ is not is not just something I do for BJJ, but also as a grappling. Um, I want to be a proficient grappler if I'm in armor or if I'm uh, doing other martial arts as well. And it just makes more sense to be on top, especially if you're in armor, because, you know, if it was a battlefield situation, for instance, you want to be able to see what's going on. You want to be able to stand up. 
you want to, uh, you know, put them on the ground and, you know, finish them off rather than, you know, worrying about, I, I mean, I can't imagine like you could try to do like a triangle choke if you're in armor, but that's, that's not that applicable. So I really prefer to be on top. And I like, I, one of my favorite submissions is the arm bar because I feel like I can get it from anywhere. So when I was, when I had first started out in G Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, I did a lot of triangles and I fought a lot off, off my back and, uh, you know, I was pretty successful at it, but given a choice, I'd rather be on the top of the big guys. <laughs> no, absolutely. I understand that. Yeah, I understand. That. Um, this is really, this is really clear. I mean, it, it reminds me, oh God, I forgot his name again. One of our colleagues, he's a very good black belt in BJJ from France. And he exactly says, and he is also in security business and he always warns all his uh, students of BJJ, don't lie, you know, try to be on your back for the street or for security. That's, he keeps saying it. Oh, he has also in his in French. He has a very good. Oh, he did sometimes some in English as well. Exactly the same. You say. Then he say, don't mix them up. Be on top. Be on top. And he also teaches many MMA and for MMA today for today because many people learn that it's a be on top position. Be on top positions, right? That's what exactly what you said mm -hmm. as well. That's what he said. It's very interesting to see that you're sharing the same opinion with him. Um, okay, very good and. Uh, what, did I, what else? Okay, so uh, what kind of um, throws do you like? Because this is a question that people always want to know. You know, if you are in a stand-up position, which which one do you like? Oh, I I like doing arm drags a lot and arm taking drags. the back and then okay. just knocking them over from there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, arm drag. Okay, a very. I mean, it's a wrestling move, right? Mostly, but okay, in judo we have it yeah. as well. I, you know, I, I really love judo and it, I, I hurt my knee last year and that's part of why I haven't been practicing very much. Uh, we had just gotten a judo uh, teacher and so I was just starting to become more proficient at that. But me, I've, I've always kind of lacked enough proficiency to really be able to apply uh, judo um, and that's that's my feeling. That's not a feeling on judo. Judo is incredible. So, <laughs> so I stick with some more of the wrestling techniques and stuff because I've been able to pull that off more reliably. Okay, interesting. Very nice. Okay, could you please share with us any other martial arts experience you have or you had and you would like to share with our viewers? Okay. Um. Well, like in the. Uh, I served eight years in the Marine Corps, and while I was in the Marine Corps, I uh, was a uh, instructor trainer for the Marine Corps Martial Arts Program uh, called McMath. So um, it's been kind of interesting. Um, I've been both a student and a teacher on the civilian side, and then I was able to apply a lot of what I knew from studying martial arts in the civilian context to um, be able to teach more effectively in the combatives program. Interesting. Ah, so both sides like overlapping each other, you're saying, right? Sure. Um, there's a lot of overlap. And um, I'd say being able to be a civilian and having had that experience and having that depth of experience from doing martial arts in the civilian world really helped me as a, an instructor for the military as well. Um, because a lot of times in the military, they try to um, get people to a certain level of proficiency very quickly. And sometimes I feel that um, it's just really beneficial to have the depth of having had the luxury to really study martial arts before I went in, so. Uh, okay. Yeah, of course. I understand that. Yeah, of course. Yeah, you don't have so much time to spend then. Yeah, of course. I understand. That. Right. That's right. <laughs> very nice. Very good. Very good. Could you tell us about the striking arts you practiced, like punching, kicking, and things like that? So when I was uh, in the military, I met a uh, really good uh, coach um, for boxing. Uh, his last name was Jones, Staff Sergeant Jones, and uh, he uh, 
taught a little bit of boxing on the weekends. And I went and I learned from him for about six months. Um, like I said, I don't consider myself a striker. I don't consider myself a Muay Thai person, but I was able to take six months of boxing and my instructor was really a great instructor and, and those fundamentals have stuck with me. Um, and so like, you know, I apply it when I do my little boss route and workouts and stuff like that. And, uh, it's been really good. Um, another friend of mine does more Muay Thai and we've been able to do a little bit of, um, training here and there. Um, but like I said, I don't consider myself a Muay Thai person. Although I do consider bo both boxing and Muay Thai to be very valuable martial arts. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Could you tell us about uh, your favorite combination in boxing or not? I make it easier for you. <laughs> well, favorite. No, no, I know. Because, you know, I spent many years boxing. I'm sorry, it's not fair. It's not fair. Your favorite punch in boxing. I'm sorry, Shannon. I just, your favorite punch in boxing. Is it like jab? Is it like cross? Is it like short uppercut, long uppercut, short hook, long hook? Which one do you like? Or overhand? I always like when box is like liver punch. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you cannot choose? Huh? You cannot choose between one of them as your favorite punch? I mean, when, when I was doing boxing and I was sparring more, um, I did a lot of jabs because my instructor um, wanted me to use my height and my reach a lot. Um, for your viewers who have no idea how tall I am, I'm six feet tall and I have very long arms. And so my, my instructor was like, You're, you've got long arms, keep them at a distance. Um, and, and use that. But um, I always threw my jabs kind of like they were knockout punches as well. So <laughs> I mean, it, it, yeah, you use a jab as a setup, but you can, you can hit pretty darn hard with a jab too. Um, you know, the, I'm, uh, okay, you're so young, you don't possibly, you've never watched that, but maybe if you watched old videos, Larry Holmes knocked so many people with his jab. He had such a stiff jab. I mean, actually, his jab was a cross. I mean, I, mean, Larry, <laughs> you know, I, mean, I remember people always say, Larry, did you mix up cross with jab? And say, oh yeah. So his jab was so stiff. He knocked people out with a jab. Can you believe that? I mean, you don't hey, see man. it. In, you see, it's, you good, know? it's good to be able to reach out and touch somebody sometimes. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> so you know what you said reminds me of Larry Holmes, right? So, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it didn't matter. He uh, Both hands, he could knock you out. Left and right. So no setup, right? Nice. I mean, there are some people who like like this um, with them. Um, if you're left hand, like a left hook, this is many people are experiencing after a jab giving a left, left hook. Do you like this combination, Shannon? I do. I do. I like the hooks quite a bit as well. Um, I don't know. I view them all as, as um, you know, just ways to get to where you want. But like I said, I, I don't consider myself a true striker. Um, six months of boxing while... I learned quite a bit. I don't feel like that makes me um, a boxer really, um, but it was a very valuable experience and I'm really glad I did it. And if I had more time, I would totally do boxing and Muay Thai as well. What is your favorite kick, Shannon? As uh, far as kicking is concerned. My favorite kick? Oh, probably just the regular Muay, Muay Thai kick. Oh, shinking. Um, okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, all right. <laughs> right. Of course, the shinking. Okay. At some point, I really need to actually learn Muay Thai because I've got, you know, long legs and it'd be much better if I knew how to use them better. Um, but. I mean, I mean, and you can also. I mean, as far as your height is concerned, and because you know grappling, Muay Thai grappling, and then kneeing the person would be an absolute, I mean, if you learn the knee combination with your grappling experience, with your long legs, will be a very, very good thing, right? Yeah. <laughs> few people master knee techniques, right? Few people. The reason is, I mean, because they cannot control the body, because when they hold the person, I mean, Muay Thai, Thai they can all do that. 
but you know, you, as I said, you know, you can, it's like being a Greek or Ro Roman wrestler when they hold you, mm -hmm. and then they deliver vicious knees. They can jump mm -hmm. a knee he will hear he everywhere to your legs, to your body, <laughs> and you know, very interesting because.